whatever. Our goal is that you'll enjoy this, get some information, and you will go out and make a difference. And thank you. Just a reminder, this event will be recorded. So while you're listening to the presenters, if your camera is on, um, your image and your name might be captured in the recording. If that's not something that you can support for yourself personally, then keep your camera dimmed or you might want to catch the recording later if you need to leave the presentation today. We totally understand. The QR code, if you have the ability and you've got two devices, go ahead and use the QR code on the screen or We've dropped the link in the chat for you, but we hope that you're going to get engaged with our engagement canvas course. This is a tool that we use at the college to put out all of our announcements for events for speakers. It also hosts 1 of our um, features, our civic action card that I am going to talk about. We have 2, 1 for faculty and 1 for students. The Civic Action Council is one of our student leader teams through our Net Impact Student um, Led Organization. It includes our MCC Vote Coalition, our MCC Student Fellows, Andrew Goodman Ambassadors, and it focuses on developing civic knowledge so that when our students graduate MCC, they can become part of their community and active. We hope that you join us Mondays at 3 p.m. It is a virtual meeting. The Community Service Council is also equally important because we work on projects that benefit both our campus and our greater community. Some of our previous projects have included our book drives, hosting Special Olympics, working with Autism Society of Greater Phoenix on Lego Club. And it's really a great place to try out your skills, develop leadership skills. We hope that you will join us virtually Tuesdays at 3 p.m. and plan some great events. We are on the lookout for students who would like to develop leadership skills. Our net impact officer team is in charge of developing and planning and running our student organization, net, net impact. You will have leadership skills, um, career opportunities that develop from the projects you're planning. Scan the QR code or follow the link. Even if you think you're not a leader yet, you're the exact right person that needs to join this and apply. Um, so the different positions for net impact, there's the chapter president. We do operate on both the Red Mountain campus, the Southern and Dobson campus, and of course our downtown center students are also welcome to join net impact. There's a vice president on both of our full service campuses, a civic action officer who leads the Monday meetings, a community service officer who leads Tuesday meetings, and then our connecting our student connections officer and operation officer. Do not delay. Shannon served as our president last year. It's a great opportunity. Students in action opportunity. What student does not need more money for their education? So MCC student vote fellows get a $600 semester stipend for supporting opportunities to educate fellow students on voting and help get people registered to vote. So we hope that you will join us for that. Civic Engagement Scorecard um, was what I mentioned is on our Engagement Canvas course. This is something that is really important for students. It's an opportunity to explore many areas of um, civic engagement. And as you do so, you're going to earn points. And as you earn points, you're going to be eligible to receive the digital badges, recognizing your efforts from the level of MCC engaged student all the way up to MCC civic scholar gold level. This can be put on your resume. It can be put on scholarship applications. It's really a great opportunity. So join our Canvas course and start doing very um, 
fun and entertaining assignments. Civic Action Hour, October events. Man, is it already October? So we've got Vote Down Your Ballot, Harnessing the Power of Urban Trees, Ballot Overview, our Desert Wildlife. We've got a great lineup. Deborah has done a great job with our prisoners. We hope you will continue to join us every Wednesday at noon. Remember to register to vote. It is simple. The links are in your chat. Make your voice heard. Your voice does matter. So we encourage everybody here, whether they're student, staff, faculty, or community member, to register to vote and exercise that right. Today's speaker, we are delighted to have Kate and Patrick with us. They will be speak on speaking on bipolar disorder two faculty stories so let's give them a warm welcome through your clapping and we're gonna get started thank you thanks everybody So I'll begin by introducing myself. My name is Kate Moeller, and I have been teaching English at Mesa Community College since 1995. I currently serve as the secretary for Ability Maricopa, which is our district's group. It's our advocacy group for employees with disabilities. And I wanna make a special thank you to the Center for Community and Civic Engagement and and Deborah Olinger for hosting today. Deborah always does such a marvelous job and we are very appreciative of this opportunity. And Patrick? Hi, I'm Patrick Finn and I'm a faculty member at Chandler Gilbert Community College and I've taught at Chandler Gilbert since uh, 2007. And the first question that we'll be covering today is the basic, what is bipolar disorder? Bipolar disorder is a mood disorder characterized by a very high mood, which is known as mania, and very low mood, which, which is clinical depression or suicidal depression. So when you hear the term bipolar disorder, um, those, that very high and low stage might come to mind. But there are so many other aspects, so many other symptoms um, of bipolar disorder. And some of those are anxiety, emotional dysregulation, addictions, disordered eating, risk-taking behavior, and hypersexuality. So bipolar disorder looks different for everyone. Not one person has the same bipolar disorder that another person does. Yeah, there's a whole spectrum. And Patrick, how would you define bipolar disorder in your personal experience? Well, Kate's definition um, matches my experience uh, for the most part. Uh, I definitely have battled with highs and lows that cycle rapidly all throughout my life. Um, but now I'm, and I hope to talk more about treatment today as well. So, um, but I, I think Kate, you're spot on. That covers a lot of ground, and I would say that's a clear illustration of uh, many of the aspects of the illness that I have as well. About two to four percent of the general population suffers from bipolar disorder. It's really hard to determine an exact percentage because so many people are un, undiagnosed or they, they simply don't realize that they have bipolar. Um, you know, so it's, and it's, a hard, it's a hard disorder to diagnose because it looks like a lot of others, especially with depression. Many people have depression and 
and they get treated for depression, but what they really have is bipolar disorder. And when you're treating bipolar disorder just for the depression, that can have disastrous results. Because antidepress antidepressants can uh, trigger manic episodes, actually. Um, so those misdiagnoses are, are incredibly difficult and frustrating. Um, you, you think, well, why, why didn't someone catch this years ago? I could have started my treatment and my medication regimen a lot earlier. Uh, you know, I don't blame anyone because, like Kate said, it's 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 difficult to diagnose. It could be mistaken for depression or ADHD, um, personality disorders. There, uh, I've been diagnosed and misdiagnosed many many times, and I'll talk more about that. Yeah. Right. Our our first major question is how did you first get diagnosed? And both Patrick and I have a good story about that. <laughs> uh, I was 46 years old before I was diagnosed with bipolar disorder. I had no idea that I had bipolar disorder, even though I was exhibiting many of the major symptoms throughout my life. If, I, if, I, if it had been brought to my attention somehow, I may have decided earlier, aha, I, maybe I do have bipolar disorder, but I never had a mania. And a mania is the outstanding feature of bipolar disorder. Um, it can also be hypomania, which is less than mania. But I didn't know I had bipolar disorder until 2016 when I did have a, a pretty wild mania. And what happened to me is that I'm also an alcoholic. I quit drinking in 2014. And in 2015, I think my brain chemistry was confused. My brain didn't quite know what to do without the alcohol, but with no medication for bipolar disorder. So I was, my, my brain sent me into a mania, which is a highly euphoric state. It's an agitated state of high energy and sleepless nights. And when you're manic, you know, you, you definitely experience trouble at work, trouble at home. Uh, people don't understand what you're up to. And, you know, you're talking excessively. You're manic. And that's what happened to me in the spring semester of 2016. I was definitely in a bipolar mania at work. And I got into so much trouble at my work that since I, since I had a condition called anosognosia, and anosognosia means lack of insight into your illness. I didn't realize that I was in a bipolar mania. So everyone or most everyone around me knew better than I did that I was ill. So I was kind of at the mercy of others to make sense of the world I was suddenly in. And I just didn't get it. And many people can attest to that fact who who, people who were around me and worked with me and my students. I was very irritating and I was very irritable. And there were so many things going wrong for me that all I could think was that I had a brain tumor. That's what came to my mind. So finally, I had lost a bunch of weight. I was not sleeping at night. I'm, I was a wreck. I went to my doctor thinking I must have a brain tumor. And she held up a list of bipolar manic symptoms. And there I was. I recognized myself. I wasn't in anosognosia anymore because I realized in that moment in the doctor's office that yes, I was in a bipolar mania and I was sick and I needed to be medicated. And that was a long, process for me in the spring of 2016 
And I spent, you know, I've spent all the time since then, since then healing from that very traumatic episode at work. So that's how I got diagnosed. Patrick, can you speak to that? Sure. My uh, first diagnosis was based on some suspicions I had that I actually might have it. Uh, I had been through years of depression. I mean, my whole life. Uh, and uh, though I I turned to doctors to to uh, treat my depression, like we said earlier, I was, I was misdiagnosed for years and just treated for depression. But I would have the, the depressions would be punctuated by these moments of euphoria, uh, hyperactivity, uh, rapid speech, um, not needing sleep at periods, and then crashing again to, into depression. And so, you know, I heard about it, and I started looking at uh, looking at symptoms. And so, I, I brought them to to my psychiatrist and said, "This is what I'm experiencing," and um, and he said, yes, this is bipolar disorder, definitely. And he put me on a medication regimen. And, you know, I was, because I felt it was in part self-diagnosed, I was always a little suspicious about whether or not I actually had it. And I think part of me just didn't want to, didn't want to admit that I actually had it. So, uh, so that was 2008 and I was 35 at the time. Um, a few years later, I was tested again and I went through a whole battery of uh, questions, part of a psychiatric evaluation. And it was the doctor concluded that I didn't have bipolar disorder, that it was strictly depression. So I uh, went off my meds that I'd been given for, for bipolar disorder. And over the course of the next year, my hypomania, which is again, a little bit less than, than full manic, but it's still energized and, and agitated and, and very uncomfortable and cause a lot of problems. But over the next year or two, uh, my, my hypomania started to increase. My symptoms started to increase more uh, severe depression and what's called uh, mixed episodes. I've since learned are called mixed episodes, which are uh, a combination of mania and depression at the same time. Um, so you have a very uh, urgent, like self hatred. Uh, you're energized to feel a lot of self hatred, um, and there's very little pause. And I was also rapid cycling, which means these highs and lows happen quite frequently. Um, and then uh, it got. Then I, I got into full mania, and I had to and. Um, it was a, a state of agitation, um, again, a, a kind of a combination of sheer energy and, and absolute despair at the same time. And then it reached a point, uh, this is back in 2014, 2015, where I had to take a long medical leave um, because I was hospitalized and spent a good amount of time in the hospital. I was in and out for several months, in fact. Um, some stays were longer than the other, but they couldn't see it. And so I was then re-diagnosed when I was hospitalized. It was kind of an interesting situation. I uh, didn't know what was wrong. I, everybody else knew something was wrong. I felt something, you know, was off too. Um, and I so I, when I was uh, hospitalized and I went in for the intake, I was talking nonstop. Uh, I remember this just, you know hyper energized to tell the psychiatrist everything about my whole life. And he finally interrupted me and said, okay, I think I'm going to diagnose you as bipolar. Um, and uh, at first I thought, well, here we go again. Um, but I believed him and I thought, what a relief. I can finally get help. I know that there's help available. Finally, that somebody can do something about this state I'm in. Um, but you know, it wasn't all roses. There was a lot that was accompanied uh, that accompanied that period. But one of the feelings I did have was relief, and I that I was able to get help. And we do have a question in the chat: Is how is bipolar different from schizophrenia? You know, bipolar disorder 
people with bipolar disorder don't necessarily have delusions and they're, they're not necessarily paranoid, but people who have schizophrenia often suffer from paranoid delusions. So, and it's very incapacitating and it gets worse left untreated as you get older. So, you know, schizophrenia is, is a very difficult disorder to control. Bipolar disorder, there are, there are certain medications that seem to be able to rein in those of us with bipolar disorder. Schizophrenia really is, is even more encompassing mentally and debilitating. Uh, part of, and again, because this is a whole spectrum and people have different, uh, different symptoms. I, for one, definitely had episodes of severe paranoia, um, paranoid delusions, which could add up to what's called uh, bipolar with, with uh, schizoaffective, uh, schizoaffective features, as my psychiatrist says, and that's when it's, you know, at its absolute worst. So, uh, sometimes, again, because there's a spectrum, there may be crossover uh, and, and possible misdiagnosis once again, um, but there are some significant differences between the two as well as similarities. One question we have is how did bipolar disorder affect your performance as a student throughout the years? And for me, since I wasn't diagnosed until I was 46, when I look back at my years of being a student, I don't look back at a bipolar student. I look back at myself struggling with the symptoms that come along with bipolar disorder, mainly anxiety and depression. Uh, on the outside, you would have seen a well-adjusted, uh, you know, clean, well-dressed young lady um, and, but on the inside, it was very tumultuous for me. I was, I had a lot of anxiety. I always did well at school. I excelled at school. I enjoyed doing, um, you know, I enjoyed doing the work to get the good grade, grades and the recognition and moving forward. And I went to grad school and I really have been a student all my life. But when I was younger and in college, uh, you know, I, and I was also drinking. I drank the whole way through my education. And I can't say that that helped my student experience. It was difficult for me. You know, I was trying to change my mind before I knew that I must. But I was doing it the wrong way. And I was doing it with alcohol. Patrick, your experience? Yeah, I was a really a, a disastrous grade school and high school student. My my, I was already by third, fourth grade failing all my classes, um, and uh, it was a pattern that followed me through high school. And um, of course, nobody knew that, and including myself, that I was suffering from a mental illness. And instead, I was just called lazy, um, you know, directionless, especially lazy. Um, when I got to, I, I started my college career at community college and for a number of reasons, I eventually decided that I needed to buckle down and, and do well in school. And, um, I have to be honest and say that, uh, hypomania, even though I didn't know I had hypomania, um, helped my grades. Um, I was able to stay focused, uh, especially in graduate school. Uh, I, I, I would go without sleep. Um, but then I would have these crashes. So what that meant was it would just take me a lot longer to, uh, to finish assignments than anyone else. So that meant virtually no social life, uh, which led to isolation and despair. But, um, but it, it, you know, and I, like you, Kate, I, I would get a lot of recognition and praise in my graduate program because I was producing so much, um, but it was at a, a definite cost and I would, I would hide the, uh, the, the depressive crashes. You know, I just 
wouldn't be available to anyone for some stretches of time. I would still show up to class and you know, force myself to be there. But so that's pretty much how it's affected me my whole life. Great, great, uh, grade wise, school wise. And, -wise. and we do have several questions in the chat. Uh, one of them is how much information do you disclose to your colleagues and has this affected your workplace uh, interactions? Well, you know, I think my okay. colleagues couldn't help but notice that there was something wrong with Kate. And long before I knew that there was something wrong, and, and that was just when I was in my mania, I was also an active alcoholic, alcoholic all the way through my career. So as you can imagine, I, I was not presenting as a good colleague that whole time, you know, I managed to get the job done. I, I served on committees, you know, I attended meetings, but I was inappropriate, you know, I was inappropriate. I said inappropriate things. I, I was not my best human all the way through. And, and I still, I feel like apologizing to my colleagues, you know, and anyone else who had to suffer me through those years, I feel that I wasn't very present during all that time. And I feel much more present now and able to be much more effective as an instructor and as a colleague. Uh, I'm not sure about the rest of that question. I want to give Patrick a chance to answer. Sure. After I returned from uh, the long medical leave I mentioned that I took, um, I, you know, I, w I told some people, I wasn't very selective about who I told and who I didn't. If it just came up in conversation, I would mention, yeah, you know, I got hospitalized for bipolar disorder. And, you know, the response was consistently supportive. I'm very lucky in that respect. Nobody that I work with um, distanced themselves from me or started to act negatively around me because of what I disclosed. So um, I'm, I am pretty open about it. I, I do talk about it with my students because um, I want to advocate for them uh, if, if anyone else is suffering from the same type of mental illness or any type of mental illness. It can be very isolating and you don't have much hope for a future. But I like to share with people that there is there can be hope and there is there is a future if there's if there's treatment involved. So I would say. Uh, it was a very, very difficult time to reintegrate re myself into my workplace after the, after my my series of hospitalizations, uh, especially because I was on such a high dose of lithium. Lithium is a mood stabilizer. It's also a metal uh, that that limits the uh, the expansion of manic episodes or even hypomanic episodes. So lithium was incredibly helpful for me, but it also numbed me. And I had a great deal of cognitive dulling. Uh, it was very difficult to read. And since I'm a writing teacher, you know, I have to read a lot. But it was, again, it was like graduate school and undergrad where it would just take me a lot longer to get reading done and to respond to, to student work. Um, but that's, yeah, I think that's, that's about the long and the short of it for that question. I can add that my own work life has completely changed due to bipolar disorder. Uh, after my mania in 2016 and my diagnosis then, I was given a work accommodation to teach online only. Up to that point, I had taught online classes. I've been teaching online since 1995, but I always taught on campus as well. Now, with my accommodation for my disability, I teach online only. And I can say when that, when I was given that accommodation, you know, it was the best thing that could have happened to me at the time because I was so traumatized by everything I had been through. And I was just really a sliver of who I had been. And it took so long to, to crawl back from, from where I had been, you know, all the, all the trauma 
that I had experienced. And it, it really took a lot out of me. It took the, the life out of me. So that accommodation of teaching online only gave me the peace and the time I needed to heal from a traumatic event. So I, I really gathered myself together. It took years because I suffered a clinical depression after my mania, which is very common. And as, as high as your mania might take you left, especially untreated as mine was, that's as low as your, as your depression is going to take you. And I, I had a I suicidal know. depression oh. and I'm, I can't tell you how fortunate I feel to be here today. I don't know how I got through that. And I did my work at the same time. It was all I could do to get to the computer and do some grading, you know, and if I would have had to somehow get myself to campus into an office, I, it would have take, it wouldn't have happened. So my workplace accommodation saved my job and it saved me. And at the same time, I can say it was very isolating at a time where I actually needed community. So I was alone at home trying to heal. And I had a lot of explaining to do, believe me. After all I had, all the trouble I had caused, uh, I had a lot of apologies to make. And really that has been, that healing process and recovery process is still going on. Six and a half years later, Now with my work life, I, I get to help others who, who had to go through what I went through. And I, tr I hope that they don't have to suffer as long as I had to suffer left undiagnosed in anosognosia. Um, I was very lucky to get diagnosed when I did so that it didn't have to go on even longer. Yeah, I feel that same uh, sense of luck. You know, people say, don't you, don't you wish it would have got, they would have caught it earlier? No, I'm just glad they caught it when they did. Uh, so it didn't have to continue, you know. Yeah. But, you know, you talk about the amount of time it takes to reintegrate and heal. Um, and this came up in one of the questions. Uh, it, it takes, it took me a very, very long time to find the right combination of medication under the direction of a, of a care team, including a psychiatrist. Um, it took a good year before I, uh, I had the kinds of medications, like a lower dose of lithium, a couple other mood stabilizers to overcompensate, to compensate for what I lost in the lowered lithium, uh, antipsychotics. Um, but, you know, the, it, it took, like I said, a good year to find that just kind of perfect combination to ensure my stability in either direction and in, in the ups or downs. And that's, that can be incredibly frustrating that you, you know, you feel what's wrong with me. Why don't the meds, why doesn't this medication work for me? It works for Charlie. Well, medications, uh, just like the illness itself, uh, people respond with a whole spectrum. Uh, they medications just don't work the same for, for everybody, uh, which is why it can take so long to get the, the, the right dose. Yes, we and I will question. Say, we have a question in the chat. Um, can high anxiety lead to bipolar disorder? And how can you confirm yourself um, having it before heading to a doctor? Well, having anxiety does not mean that you have bipolar disorder. You might just have anxiety, and that might be your disability. Bipolar disorder has a, an array of symptoms, and one of them is anxiety. Uh, there was a question, part of that question had to do with getting to a doctor. I think that now when we see mental illness in the news and in the media, we have you know, sports stars taking mental health breaks, it's becoming part of our culture. And I think that's helping a lot of us kind of come out from where we were hiding, alone, miserable, knowing that, aha, this is actually pretty common. I mean, if, 
if two to four percent of the population have bipolar disorder, you're in good company. You have a lot of company. There are lots of people out there suffering um, and, and not suffering because once you find the right medication for you, which you should always strive for and never give up searching for, you will be fine. Uh, many people don't like to take their medication because it reduces their creativity or it makes them gain weight or it makes them, gives them brain fog. And I always say, well, those aren't the right medications for you. If they're giving you those symptoms, then you need to go to your doctor, go to your psychiatrist, psychiatrist and say, I need a better medication, one that fits me. Because just because you're on medication for bipolar disorder, doesn't mean that you should have to give up enjoying your life or being creative or being productive. We uh, also have another question. Um, I work with students with BPD who become incredibly aggressive towards people in our office. Has this been a behavior you've exhibited? Not to the Has extent of uh, terribly violent outbursts, though, I would say unreasonable agitation uh, was was definitely a symptom of, that accompanied my my paranoia. The paranoia would make me very agitated, but um, not not that not violent or that ag aggressive. BPD stands for borderline personality disorder. And borderline personality disorder is different than, bi than bipolar disorder. Borderline personality disorder is marked by angry outbursts um, and high suicidal tendency and homicidal tendency. People with borderline personality disorder create a lot of chaos sometimes. Uh, in their personal lives, they experience chaos and disorder in their personal lives and at work. And it is, it's a tough road for those with borderline personality disorder. But there is great therapy um, for, by, for borderline personality disorder. And I have a lot of information on that if you want to contact me after. Um, there's all different kinds of therapies that are meant for specific disorders and there's one for for borderline that really has made a difference for a lot of people the next question is is bpd hereditary or can a trauma or anxiety trigger this i my, my personal experience and my experience with those uh whom i also know with bipolar disorder um it many say it is hereditary, that it, uh, mental illness does run in families. Um, and I definitely can attest to that. And as well, so it was hardwired to have it, but I will say that different things can certainly trigger an episode. For me, traveling can sometimes uh, trigger some hypomania. Um, moving to a new location can trigger hypomania and also the, the crashes that, that accompany that hypomania. So a little bit of both. Okay, and then there's another question. How did you manage your disorder after you got diagnosed? And what did you change in your day-to-day -day or whenever you had an episode from then on? You know, I can say, and I, I'm pretty sure Patrick will agree that keeping a schedule has been very important in managing my bipolar disorder. I like routine. I thrive on routine and I get, you know, a little shaken up if I have to deviate from my regular routine. So it is, it is such, it's been such a boon to have the accommodation of teaching online only because I can, I can regulate my life according to my moods. I know when I'm going to be, have good energy for work and I know when I need to rest and I can give myself a break when I need one. So 
and so, sometimes we tend to be, you know, a little hyper vigilant for our schedules. You know, we really like it to go our way. You know, we don't want to deviate from the routine because we find such comfort in it. And I can see Patrick smiling. Yeah, I'm routine is essential to my survival. And I too, like you, if that routine is disrupted, I start to get a little squirrely and uh, uh, really need that that definite schedule in order to, you know, it's a it's a coping mechanism, I feel to uh, hold on to structure in an otherwise structureless experience or what can be an otherwise structureless chaotic experience. It, it's some control. No surprises. Right. <laughs> right. Okay. Um, the next question is how long did it take you to get your medication figured out? And do you still have episodes today with meds? It took a very long time for me to get the right medication. I had been left in mania for so long that I, I suffered some cognitive dysfunction. And so it was doubly hard for me to take care of myself and pursue getting the right medication. And then I went into my clinical depression. So it was a journey, an arduous journey for me to find the right medication that not only was going to prevent me from soaring in the mania again, but was going to pull me out of this suicidal depression. And I remember running to my psychiatrist every week saying, this isn't working. This is not working. And I don't think having experienced a suicidal depression, I, I understand why, why people suffer so. Uh, I understand why it's so, so difficult to keep trying, but I knew intellectually that there was something wrong with me. I knew intellectually that there was a medication out there. I just hadn't found it yet. And now I'm so lucky. I have a great medication. I only have to take one, you know, Patrick takes a few or a couple. I only have yeah. to take one, but that's just right now. That doesn't mean it's going to last forever. That could change tomorrow. And again, I thank my school and my district for providing me the accommodation that helps me excel when I'm able to, like now. Yeah, it was a, it was a, it was a journey for me too. I think I mentioned that it was a good year before I found the right combination. And it, during that journey, when I started, not long after I started taking lithium and, and antipsychotics, I put on a good 40 pounds, uh, which is incredibly unhealthy for me, um, lead to heart problems and diabetes and that sort of thing, of course. But I had a, a, a misguided psychiatrist when I got out of the hospital. When I, when I expressed concern about my weight gain and my overall health from taking these medications, his response was, well, just don't eat so much. Uh, at lunchtime, just have yogurt and a piece of beef jerky. And that's all you should have during the day until dinner and don't eat so much dinner. <laughs> it's like, thanks. So that's another part of the journey. Sometimes there are uh, some of the, the, your therapists or your psychiatrists aren't always that understanding. I'm very lucky to have uh, care now that specialists that actually listen to me and uh, help me advocate for myself and make me part of the conversation about how my meds are going. Um, one part of that question uh, that was just asked, you know, do I still have symptoms with medication? And I do have muted symptoms, absolutely. That has had to, I've had to make changes. If I write uh, at night, Writing at night can trigger uh, hypomania. Uh, so that's a change. I had to completely rearrange my writing schedule because I would write so often at night. Um, taking my medication every day religiously. And Kate mentioned how some people stop taking it. One of the reasons people stop taking, people with bipolar disorder stop taking their medication is that they feel good. They feel fine because the medications are working. 
but they say, well, I, I must not need them anymore because I'm okay now. And they stop taking them and disaster follows. All right, um, we have another question. Do you feel being sober has helped with your diagnosis and in what way? Being sober has helped with my entire life. Recovering from alcoholism has improved my existence on the planet 200%. I can't recommend it enough. Um, I, was, I was lucky in a way yeah, I went to rehab, so I knew that I had a problem. So I took myself to rehab and, and that helped me get sober, but it was only after rehab when my brain was able to wake up enough on its own, you know, after having been, you know, under the influence for 46 years, uh, that I went into mania, but I can't imagine trying to drink and and maintain this wonderful life i've got going now i would never go back i would never trade and yeah i can't say enough good things about not doing drugs or alcohol there's um, often but, stimulants and depressants why would one want to invite those into an already fragile state of being um you know uh, the next question is, uh, what are some symptoms that are more subtle than most? I'm hiding one right now um, called psychomotor agitation. Because you learn how to hide some things. Like, I'll show you what it looks like. I'm always doing this. Um, and that's called psychomotor agitation. And I hide that. I, I'm taking it off screen right now. And it happens if I get nervous. So, yeah, I'm a little nervous talking about all of this. Um, so, but it, I, I think it's, it, it's, it's subtlety comes from my ability to hide it. And also the other coping mechanism, which is sometimes rocking, um, you know, I try to keep that under wraps <laughs> at meetings. So, um, and I, you know, I, I don't want you to think I'm being insensitive by kind of chuckling about this. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's one of my ways of coping and surviving is to be able to just kind of laugh at some of these things that happen it takes takes the edge off makes it seem less isolating and you know a closet of despair there's also an interesting condition or symptom called clang association clang association and that means when in your mind you're saying nonsense rhyming words you're making things up rhyming things associating words in your in your brain um and maybe you're doing this to self-soothe because you have anxiety but it's nonsense talk but it, it has a name it's called clang association and many right. people if you have uh autism autistic folks will often experience the clang association it's it's for self-soothing you know and sometimes i find myself doing it walking from the car into my house at, as if that short trip is going to do me in. <laughs> yeah, I, I have that too. I, you know, for me, it's making up little songs that rhyme, even though they're nonsensical. Or if I see, if I see an example of writing, even in a newspaper online that has alliteration in it, the repetition of vowel sounds or consonant sounds, I latch on to alliteration, uh, like, like it's a, a, a life-saving device. Like I saw a headline once in an entertainment section of a newspaper, Hot Ticket Hamlet. And Hot Ticket Hamlet was an article about this performance of Hamlet, Shakespeare's Hamlet, that was very successful. But when I saw Hot Ticket Hamlet, I just, I couldn't stop repeating that to myself. Just the alliteration was, was pleasurable. Okay, we have another question. Can you both share how we can be better responders, supporters in our colleges? And what can we do better to support staff and students who have similar experiences? Well, I absolutely love that question. Getting diagnosed with bipolar disorder has completely changed the way I teach. And it has totally improved 
the way I interact with students. I, I like to think that I'm much more patient now. I'm much more patient. I'm, I, I give extra time. I don't ask, you know, I take all excuses. Um, I don't, I don't pry, you know, students get what they need. And, you know, I don't find that students ask for things that they don't need. When students come with an issue, especially needing more time, I have all the time in the world, at least up until about December 16th or whenever that semester ends, I have time. I can be flexible. I can be accommodating. And I am much more, much more apt to do that now than I was before my diagnosis. Now I know that not only are students themselves struggling with mental distress sometimes, but their family members are. So they, they are experiencing mental distress and, and difficulties outside of the classroom. And when they, get, when they get into our classes, we need to understand that and accommodate them. We need to accommodate them with a good attitude. And we need to bring our best selves as instructors to our students who need us not just for academics, but they need us for community building. Yeah, I've uh, when I notice if a student discloses, and this has happened, suicidal ideation, you know, I, I certainly don't approach that information as a clinician. I don't say things like, well, you should be on lithium. Uh, instead, I, I will say, would you like to walk over to counseling with me? You're not in trouble. You're not going to be in trouble, but uh, you might be in a crisis right now. So let's take a walk. Would you mind walking with me over to talk to somebody? And in every instance where, where, where that's happened, they've been uh, amendable to going to talk to counseling and it has helped. Um, and I, you don't need to be a clinician. You don't need to dispense unwarranted medical advice just to listen and to uh, show someone, look, there are services here and, and opportunities and support even here on campus. Let's go check those out if you want. And I don't make it a something forced. I don't want to, like Kate says, you don't want to pry or intrude or step on anybody's toes. But at the same time, if somebody needs help, um, do what you can to uh, make sure that person is going to be safe, especially not to harm themselves. Okay, we also have another question. Do you feel it is necessary to apologize for a diagnosed mental illness? Sometimes, yeah, if, if, if I have a period of agitation, even muted agitation, that can be very difficult to live with for my, you know, on my, difficult on my family. I will, I will definitely apologize whether that's warranted or not. Um, so, yeah. That's... Absolutely. We need to take responsibility for our actions. There's who else would take responsibility for our actions, but us. So I am, I am very supportive of, of a workplace environment that that looks out for their employees, um, especially regarding mental crises. But I am just as much of a proponent for people who have mental disorders to do their best to take care of themselves. You must step up if you can and take care of yourself. You know, if you need to take medications, you need to take your medications. Um, and sometimes that's tough love. We need to, those of us who suffer, we need to step up and take care of ourselves to the best of our abilities. At the same time, those around us who see us suffering must step up and help us take care of ourselves as well. That's what community is all about. Yeah, I would have to say the same thing, feeling grateful for a supportive environment. I know that if uh, anything else happened, I, I trust and I'm so thankful that leadership here at Chandler Gilbert, my colleagues um, would, would be incredibly supportive and would have my back. So what do you what do you need? What, how can I help? I know that because I know them well enough. I've been here almost 15 years. So uh, 
I know that and I'm very thankful for that. And I will okay, add. I yeah, we are add. coming near the end. So we have about five minutes left. Um, for everybody who's here, we do have a one question survey. We would like you to uh, please complete and then uh, we'll put that link in the chat and then I'll hand it back over to Kate and Patrick if you can uh, sum up what we discussed here. And then also real quick, any unanswered questions that were in the chat will be sent to Kate and Patrick and then uh, we will email those responses out to you. Okay, so uh, go ahead and put the link in there for this uh, survey and then I will turn it over to Kate and Patrick for some final words, thank you. Thank you both very, very much. I want to emphasize this concept of anosognosia. It, it's a very little known term and concept, but what anosognosia means is that people who have mental illness might very well be completely unaware that they have a mental illness. I had anosognosia when I was in mania, and therefore I could not help myself. I, I should not have been expected to help myself because I was completely incapacitated. Now I can take care of myself because I'm, I'm better. But I think we need to understand it makes it so difficult when we're trying to do re, you know, outreach and care for people who resist care and who resist help. It, and that's, that's the real tough spot when it comes to mental disorder is trying to help people who refuse help. I would, I would add to that, especially to uh, my fellow instructors, please remember that you never know what battles people are facing. And I, like any other instructor, can get frustrated when people show up late or turn in work late or um, check out during class. That can be frustrating, of course, but you just don't know what they're dealing with. You don't always know or often know what kind of battles they're facing outside of your classroom. Um, so I err on the side of patience as I know that's easier said than done, um, but it's, a, it's really a gift. Patience is a gift you can give someone, especially in a, a state of distress. Okay, and again, um, if you could please complete the survey, we have just a few more minutes left. Um, again, Kate and Patrick, thank you so much for um, being so open in your discussions. And then I will be sending you questions that were unanswered. Um, and then you can go ahead and reply to me and I will be able to email those out to everyone. Awesome. So we have three minutes left. Are there any other burning questions out there that we can answer in three minutes? Uh, let me see. The, the next one is, how do you think bipolar disorders can affect family dynamics? And what can you do for a family member suffering with bipolar that is going through a suicidal depressive state? That's a tough question. Uh, I don't think there's one way i know how difficult it can be for families to live with somebody who doesn't who's either diagnosed or not diagnosed with with bipolar disorder any number of other mental illnesses uh, again patience and compassion and, and those are difficult to come by if you've just been yelled at by a family member if a family member has thrown something um in in a state of agitation it's it's tough to be compassionate and you've just had your feelings hurt and you feel threatened at times or you're you're the focus of someone's paranoia um it's difficult to navigate okay patience and compassion as often as you can i'll shut up now <laughs> okay um yes we are in our final minute so thank you so much i do really appreciate you coming to our civic action hour, I wish we had so much more time because there's so many questions that were in the chat. But again, I will email these to you um, and you can go ahead and email the answers back to me and then I will send it out to those who, who had asked the questions, okay? Um, thank you everyone for joining us for civic action hour. 
Um, I hope this really helps everyone understanding the different mental illness. Um, but again, thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks everybody for coming. Thank and you allowing everybody. Me to share. I know you got, a, it's a busy time of the year, of course, and you have a lot of other things to do. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you both. It was amazing. Thank you for sharing. It took a lot of courage. I appreciate it. Miss Linger. And thank you to, to Kate and thanks to Kate and Patrick. Oh, yes. Thank you. No problem. I guess I'm going to sign off then. All right. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Thank you for coming. You Thank too. you. I'll see you. I'll see you next Wednesday, Miss Olinger. Okay. Thank you, Darren. Bye bye.